clearly we live in a world of tremendous alienation. Uh, alienations everywhere, wherever humans are clustered in any ways, in private homes or in organizations or churches or denominations or political parties or business houses or universities. You name it and you will find alienation <laughs> somewhere in there. And of course, coming from Africa, generally in South Africa specifically, I've grown up and had to minister all my ministry life in contexts of alienation. Um, and it, it has to be a major concern for every one of us who's a servant of the Lord uh, because of the central place that Jesus gives to reconciliation. When in Matthew 5, 23, you remember, he says, if you're coming and bringing your religious gift and offering, uh, he, he says, and you remember that your brother has something against you, that sets the bar very high. <laughs> it's not just if you have something against your brother, but even harder thing, if your brother has something against you, go first. Be reconciled. And then bring your gifts. I've got a talk at home that I sometimes give on the five firsts of Jesus. Numbers of times when he says first. And this is, this is certainly one of them. He wants people together. And... Uh, the wonderful and inimitable John Lennox has been leading us into the book of Acts. And what we find there on the day of Pentecost, that it says when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Um, Acts 2.44, all who believed were together. Our work of African enterprise, we do missions all around Africa and cities and uh, been involved in that for 50 years. Um, and I remember when we were in Liberia, doing a mission to Monrovia, Liberia, many years ago. There was a lovely lady there called Lily. And when you was to come into the office, uh, we'd say, she'd say, hi, everybody. And we'd say, hi, Lily. How are you, Lily? She'd say, together. <laughs> come in the day, how are you, Lily, today? Together. And I thought, that's... Terrific, because that is a great New Testament word, which is a complete contrast and opposite of what the official po policy of South Africa was. Uh, first of all, they, they factor for some 300 years, and then they jury for 50, of the, 50 more of apartheid and of separateness. So we found in our work we can't evade or avoid nor should we try to the Ministry of Reconciliation. And I'm going to share in a moment some of the, uh, if you like, models or precedents of things we've tried to do, more of them in stories. But um, I think maybe it's just worth thinking very, for a moment what are some of the kind of uh, reasons and places uh, uh, for, for alienation. I suppose the first is selfishness, the root problem putting self or one's own group you know, first. That's how lots of things can go wrong. Um, I remember picking up a card in Los Angeles airport uh, a, a man was sending to his wife and it said on the front, all you ever think of is you, you, you. Then on the inside it said, from me, me, me. <laughs> in other words, that's how we all function. We tend to think you, you, you and me, me, me. So then you see alienation in nations, as like in South Africa and apartheid, where the National Party government put themselves and the interests of whites generally, Afrikaners specifically, first. It's us and our group and our nation, our folk that come first. Then, of course, there are tribal animosities like Zulu and Kosa in South Africa, Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda, Shonan and Dabele in Zimbabwe, there are the racial animosities of black and white or Jew and Arab in Israel and Gaza, ideological conflicts, socialism and capitalism, or Democrat and Republican, uh, as in the United States right now, probably more hectic than it's ever been before over there, or conservative and labor in England, or you have religious differences like Sunni and Shiite in Iraq, 
Protestant, Catholic in Ireland, and so on. So it's everywhere around us. It's inescapable. And dear ones, I want to just share for a few moments on what I consider some important capacities or, Ill or ab abilities that are required in the reconciler. And I think the, the, the first one is to deal with one's own heart first. You know, somebody, I think Tolstoy said, everybody thinks of changing humanity, but nobody thinks of changing himself. Uh, and that, in a sense, is where it has to start. There's a great uh, German Jew called uh, Paul Ostreicher, whose father suffered terrifically in the Second World War. And he, he, he said afterwards, his father said, when I look inside myself, I know that the persecutor could be me. I can never face Hitler without seeing Hitler in myself as well. And then he said, this idea that your opponent, the person who thinks differently, the person who actually wants to destroy you, is less human than you are, was something my father never allowed me to accept. So you know, why would I uh, stress this? Because the reconciler or the person seeking to bring reconciliation must have a clear, clean, and loving heart themselves. We can't come to the task of reconciliation in the marketplace or anywhere else if we are hostile to one or other of the groups. In, 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 in South Africa in 1993-94, one of the church groups who was very hostile to the the Zulu leader, Prince Mangasutu Butlezi, went to him to try and have, help him get reconciled to Mandela. But meantime, they had been very critical of him publicly in every way. And I knew when they went, they were doomed because Butlezi knew they, they were against him, they were critical of him, they were, they were hostile um, to him. So, the reconciler has to come with that clear heart themselves, and I believe with an objectivity of heart and mind and spirit. Like, like if you're doing marriage counseling, I've had the privilege of doing quite a bit of that in my life. If you are hostile and against the husband or against the wife, the, 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 the struggle is lost. You are for them, both of them. You are for the relationship. You are against the breakdown. Then I think it's also important, that, as we think in reconciliation terms, of understanding the context in which we are. And you'll all know, I'm sure, of the, the scripture in 1 Chronicles 12.32 about the men of Issachar, who had understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. So... Every time we go into any situation, we, we, have to, we have to ask ourselves whether we have an understanding of what it is that we are dealing with. I think also the problem when we come to alienation, we need to grasp that it's all about people. And very ordinary people for the most part. Um, I've had an interest in ministry to leadership for a great many years. And I remember in the early 60s, I think it was, being taken by Doug Coe, uh, one of the, who succeeded Abraham Brady in the ministry of the, uh, what was then called International Christian Leadership, or the Washington Prayer Movement now, or, or, or uh, National Prayer Breakfast Movement. And Doug said he wanted to take me to meet a congressman. I was quite nervous about this, because I hadn't mixed in that sort of group before. I was only just out of my student days. And he said, Michael, don't be so nervous. Remember, he gets into his trousers one leg at a time the same way you do. <laughs> he is an ordinary person. And so it, people come with their ordinary fears, antagonisms, pains, and inadequacies, and so forth. Then I think one of the other key principles is to come, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, is to help the protagonists uh, uh, to humanize and forgive the enemy. You know, they say if you're trying to bring people together, uh, enemies, w w we should not allow the enemy to see the other enemy with his wife and children. Because if you see the other enemy with his wife and children, you'll immediately start to humanize them, 
rather than seeing them as the enemy and as the opponents. And now I'll tell you a little bit more about that in some of our endeavors in South Africa when we brought polarized politicians together. And one of the first things we did was to help them find each other in their common humanity. They weren't Christians, they were Muslims, communists, pagans, secularists, few Christians, but how could they find each other in common humanity before moving on to the issues that um, d divide them? The other principle I think which is really, really key uh, is that we, 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 we want to follow the kind of counsel that Lincoln was talking about when he said the only way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. And that's a very powerful um, aim. An enemy love is something that the Bible talks about quite a bit, especially the, the, New, the New Testament. So to bring, that, to bring that kind of love into the situation so that it not only changes the situation, but it transforms the enemy in their own person with whom you are dealing because they haven't been handled like that. We had a private session the other morning uh, for a couple of hours with, with John Lennox, and, and he was saying the really important thing when he comes up in these debates, and he says he doesn't like the way they've got so confrontational, but between himself and some of the leading atheists, is how he conducts himself towards them with love and respect, uh, even though they are cast and the public mind is the enemy, you know, uh, Dawkins or Hawking or whatever. But he said, I don't come there and I don't come into the situation to win. I come in seeking to love them and respect them. That's really key in the heart and mind of the, the reconciler. I think the other thing is to help the protagonists hear and see the other side. St. Augustine said, Audi alterem partem, hear the other side. And again, I'll be, give some practical illustrations of this in a, in a few moments. I think there's something also quite important here, and that is for the reconciler to understand and to help alienated parties understand what I call the Peter and Cornelius principle of Acts 10. You see, in that story, I see each of the protagonists, if that's what you want to call them, as having the key to the other person's prison although they don't have the key to their own. They have the key to the other person's prison. You see, Peter the Jew in Joppa was locked in the prison of his Jewishness and his Jewish hostility and uh, religious prejudice towards, gen towards Gentiles. Similarly, Cornelius, the Gentile Roman in Caesarea, was locked in the prison of his Roman sense of superiority and hostility to the Jews. And neither had the key to their own prison, but actually each had the key to the other person's prison. In South Africa, often with whites and blacks and secular and sacred and church uh, uh, and within the church, whites could not get out of their own prison without being loved by the black man who had the key to his prison and, vi and vice versa. So when Peter and Cornelius come into this encounter, Peter discovers that God has been with Cornelius, and he's amazed. He can't get over it. And then Cornelius, the Jew, finds that, he, that, that the Jews have a genuine place in the divine economy. And so suddenly, this amazing thing happens in Acts 10, and the mission to the Gentile world is opened up. Maybe just one last thing here before I start on some illustrations, is I often think that the reconciler in both secular society, the marketplace, or even in the church, uh, maybe especially the marketplace, needs to work secretly. That may sound a little bit odd. It's hard to be a newsmaker and a reconciler at the same time. Uh, when we brought groups together in South Africa, deeply alienated people uh, being with the enemy, um, we kept the press away, kept the media away. And because, uh, you, you know, then they would exploit it and it would accentuate the hostilities and alienations. But if somehow or other we were able to do it in secret, their trust was built up and you, could move, and you could move on. Now, coming to the South African uh, 
context, one of, the, one of the first things we had to do if we were going to be reconcilers in the society was to become a, 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 a unified, reconciled team ourselves in African enterprise. And I used to say to people, African enterprise must be a testimony before it's a ministry. Um, in other words, we need to be trying to manifest what it is, the good news, what we wanted to see out there of the bad news that are, are, out there in, in the society. So, for example, we, we, then, we, we did quite a lot of initiatives to try to bring the church together, uh, uh, conflicted people, in a sense, within the church, to find each other first in reconciliation amongst each other, so then they could go out as reconcilers to the society. They could become good news and then go out and address the bad news. So, for example, in 1973, we called the first major gathering of all sectors of the church together in South Africa. Uh, the, 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 everybody said this was impossible. You couldn't get them. Uh, evangelicals wouldn't come with ecumenicals or ecumenicals with evangelicals or whites with blacks and so on. But we sought to draw people together because the major issue was the, the, the breakdown of South African society through apartheid. So as we came to this thing, one of the first things we had to do was confront the government head on that we wanted interracial uh, accommodation in the hotel, we wanted inter interracial busing, uh, and, and I, I've actually written a book on this, so there's no time to give you details, there's a lot to tell you about. But all the confrontation we had with the state, right up to cabinet level, to say you can't expect us to, to have a conference of this nature together if you won't let blacks and whites live together, <coughs> if you won't let blacks and whites ride on the same, on the same buses together. And so this was a, a, a point of major and head-on collision, um, but, but we won through. It was absolutely amazing. The government finally just simply capitulated, um, and, and we had what we wanted. And then we had an interracial rally with Billy Graham in Kings Park Rugby Stadium, and basically that was where whites went to watch rugby. We had 50,000 people of all races come, and I remember seeing a sign of a newspaper on a billboard saying, apartheid is doomed. <laughs> because suddenly people got a vision of what we were meant to look like. And that was, you know, it was absolutely, you know, amazing. Then th that gave birth to a number of other things, because th th like that, that Durban experience in 73 was the beginning of something, the beginning of creating uh, non-racial teams of, uh, of, of, of reconcilers. And we moved on then to, to be a bit more ambitious. And a few years later, we, we called a gathering in Pretoria called SACLA, South African Christian Leadership Assembly. This time we went further. We called together 6,000 leaders uh, on a non-racial basis to come, to come together for nearly 10 days and to, and to struggle with one another. One of the things we required was that whites stay in black homes and blacks in white homes. And oh, all kinds of demythologizing took place as whites were, uh, as blacks were in white homes and, you know, and, and vice versa. But the, 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 the thing was to try to get people humanized to one another, demythologized in front of one another. And we had five sub-conferences within that endeavor. First with pastors and laity leaders, next with university students, next with youth workers, the next was high school young people. Never had a conference where we call leaders from, from high schools, but, but those same leaders were going to go on and become really something. And they would be on campuses and then they'd be in businesses. And we call political and civic leaders together. Now, so they met, we started in plenary, ended in plenary, a bit like here. Yeah. But then we broke out into these five sub-conferences. But the interesting thing was that before supper each night, we had what we called pan-interest groups, where there were where there'd be about 12 people in a circle meeting for an hour, an hour and a quarter. So that in that same group, you would have someone who, who would have a politician, and then you would have a, a high schooler, 
Then you'd have a, a youth leader from Soweto. Then you'd have a businessman from Johannesburg. Then you'd have a, you'd have a pastor from a, a black township and may, maybe then a, a, you know, a, a pastor from a, a rich white suburb. Now, a, a researcher came from Harvard, PhD guy, and he researched the processes of human change. And he did a random samples out of all the, the, the 6,000 people who were in the Congress, how it affected you, because people were massively changed. Still go around South Africa, people say, Sackler was where I changed. Sackler was where I got a vision to go out to the society. And, but he said, when you study the conference, it was in the pan-interest groups, not so much the homogeneous groups of politicians or, or youth leaders or whatever, in the pan-interest groups where people were forced into facing one another, listening to one another, getting furious with one another, getting, getting tearful with one another, becoming repentant with one another. That was where the change was really taking place. And it was interesting then because, you see, the Dutch Reformed Church was a one of the major stumbling blocks. It wasn't the only one, but was one of them because they sought to legitimize apartheid theologically. Now, although we had all kinds of opposition and uphill from Dutch Reformed leaders, we finally got 500 of them there. And so impacted were they by this experience. See, they were, they were part of the problem, not part of the solution. And one of, them, one of the men majorly changed was a man called Johan Haynes who became moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, and he went back and he launched a commission in the church as to whether apartheid could be theologically justified. And this commission met. The Dutch Reformed leaders are very uh, theologically minded and normally very well educated. And, and Haynes appointed this commission. And when the synod, the next really big synod of the church met was six years later, 1986, they came out and they said, apartheid is a sin. Now, you'll remember, probably, that the, one of the major thrusts on South Africa was um, a cultural boycotts, economic boycotts, sports boycotts, and all of that. But I always maintain that far more powerful than any of those things was when the church said to the state, you cannot justify this thing theologically. That was what started to put the skids under it. Of course, people were furious, many, and Haynes paid for it with his life. He was assassinated by a bullet through his head while he was reading Sunday school stories, Bible stories to his children. So, but the point was we were starting. We were setting in motion something which, you fi which finally came to fruition in 1994. But it didn't just happen overnight. We were, we were, you know, we were working on it intently. 1985, we called 450 leaders together, so we're on now six years from, from, from Sackler. And we called a group together called the National Initiative for Reconciliation. The country was burning. We were heading into irretrievable breakdown and, at a racial level. We had 70 leaders come together and say, hey, we've got to do something quickly. And from those 70 leaders, we called together 450 absolutely key leaders, generals, at, at three weeks' notice, and they came. And what we had to try to do was to interpret the black cry to whites and the, the white fear to, to blacks, and then we had, to, we had to try to come now out from that in togetherness to challenge the state and challenge the government. We always try to do this in a relational way. Uh, in other words, we, even with the authorities, we try not to be bitter and twisted towards them, but to, to come relationally and humanly uh, to connect to them. Uh, but it was very hard to get the attention of the, the government to believe that anything serious could come from the church in terms of you know, reconciliation in the, in the marketplace. So the decision was that we would have a pray away, not a stay away, but a pray away on a working day in South Africa. When we would call South Africans 
in the mining industry and business and companies and everything else to stay home and pray. And uh, it's quite bold. Uh, we didn't use the, 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 the unions, of the, the labor unions or whatever, it was the church. We said, we call people, stay home and pray for this country that we can come for. Well, the day before the prayer way, I had a meeting with President P.W. Bota, who was then president of South Africa, and he was one, if any of you know anything about South Africa, one of the toughest uh, presidents of South Africa that we, we ever had. And uh, so as, as, I, as I, I met with him, uh, we were asking him to release Mandela, to unban the liberation movements and to take the army out of the townships. And I went as a preliminary advance guard or advance person uh, before the National Initiative for Reconciliation delegate, delegation came to meet him. And it was a very, very bruising encounter. He started standing over me reading Romans 13. I said, Mr. President, I know, I know what's in Romans 13. But Romans 13 says that the government and the state is God's servant for the good of all. And apartheid was not for the good of all, it was for the good of whites. And had to challenge, you know, Boerter, you know, to face this. And then just at that time, a document had come out from the, uh, a group of black theologians called the Kairos document. It wasn't uh, a full-blown evangelical statement, it was quite... Mixed it had some liberation theology in there. It was, it was a mixed bag statement. So Borta said to me, I know you're going on national television tonight before this, this prayer day tomorrow. And uh, he said, by the way, Mr. Cassidy, this prayer day, it will be a failure. I tell you, Mr. Cassidy, a failure, a total failure. I said, well, we'll see. Anyway, he said, <laughs> he said you're going on television tonight. He said, I want you to denounce the Kairos document. Now, you see, we're trying to get a group of non-racial reconcilers together to speak to the nation, to bring reconciliation out there in the marketplace. By asking me publicly to denounce the Kairos document, that would be splitting me as a white or sections of the church off from the other sections, you see. And uh, he said, he said, Mr. Cassidy, I will be watching the television tonight. He said, if you do not denounce the Kairos document, I will fix you personally. <laughs> he always made me fix personally. <laughs> and as everybody knew, when P.W. Border fixed people personally, you were newly, usually never heard of again. And uh, I said, Mr. Border, I'm not going to do it. I said, this is a cry from the black world, and I absolutely refuse to do it. So when I was driving over for the TV thing, I phoned Carol, and she said, I said, sweetheart, if I vanish tomorrow, uh, it's the president who will have taken me out. She said, don't you be intimidated by that bully. <laughs> and sometimes, I suppose, dear ones, what I'm saying, when we're trying to work for reconciliation, there are times when you have to have confrontation first. It's like in a marriage. Sometimes you've got to, the husband and wife have to come into confrontation as to what it's really all about before you finally get into reconciliation. And uh, that was something, you know, which we learned. I don't really have time to tell you the story because uh, <laughs> uh, it, it takes a while. But about, the Lord said to me, one day I'll give you a chance to reconcile with P.W. Boerter. And about 15 or some years later, the Lord said, I want you, Wurt had retired, I want you to go and see him where he's retired. And uh, I went to see him, I asked a friend, what must I call him? They said, you call him Um, Pia Vya. Um means uncle, and Pia Vya are the initials, P.W. When I arrived there, I said, you know, I don't know what to call you because, uh, you know, I want to call you Mr. President. He said, but he said, my friend here says, I must call you Um, Pia Vya. So he said, oh, Pia Vya is fine. So we got together, and I said to him, he told me many stories, it was very interesting. I said, you know, but I'm here for a specific purpose, because, see, I'm trying to be a reconciler, but I've got someone for whom I'm, uh, with whom I'm unreconciled. And I can't go, therefore, and carry my message through with conviction. 
So I said, I've come to get right with you because I feel very bitter towards you. Ever since you handled me that day, you know, on October the 8th, 1985. And I said, do you know what you said about the, apropos the Kairos document? You said, if I didn't denounce the Kairos people on television, you would fix me personally. And his wife said, Pierre Via, you didn't really say that, did you? And then he thought a moment or two, and then he said, but I didn't fix you, did I? <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, I mean, here I was, holding hands with P.W. Boerta and having the most tremendous time of prayer. And, I mean, some of these things led on to Boerta becoming a, a real believer. So, but, but confrontation had to come in ahead of reconciliation. And I feel very tenderly towards P.W. Boerta. But what I'm saying is, dear ones, that this is somehow has, how it has to be. Um, so I, I, I leave that with you. As we moved on, one of the things which we did from our team was to move around um, amongst all the different political groupings in South Africa. We brought some of our le leaders from Kenya, uh, e East Africa, Ghana, Zimbabwe, and elsewhere to come and celebrate the, the uh, 30th uh, uh, anniversary of our, of our work. And we decided to, to take teams and go and pray with these different politicians. You know, most, I, I prayed with many politicians. Quite often they cry when you pray for them because they're really lost. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way to turn. And we went with teams and we prayed. With, with, uh, we prayed by then Mr. F.W. de Klerk was president. We prayed with Minister Butelezi and, and prayed for him. We prayed with Mr. Andres Tronek to the extreme right wing uh, of the whites. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the sort of, uh, out there there was a thing, give us a million guns and we'll, you know, we'll solve the problem. We prayed with the leaders of the Pan-Africanist Congress, whose slogan was one settler or one white man, one bullet. We prayed with the executive committee of, of the ANC. Mandela wasn't in that day, but Oliver Tambo, the president of the ANC, was there. And they said, everyone who comes here talks politics and talks money, but you have come and ministered to us. We gave them scriptures, we gave them gospels, and, you know, and, and all of that. And it, it was a tremendous experience. And later, the Pan-Africanist Congress, one settler, one bullet, we had such an access to them that they came and they asked us if we would help them call off the armed struggle from their group. And I said, well, we'll help you if you cancel that slogan, one settler, one bullet. Because unless you're going to do that, we can't come alongside you to try and help you wind down your, your armed resistance. Now, as we, went to, as we went around these groups, we found that so many of them were saying the same sort of things. They talk about, you know, South Africa, they wanted to see democracy. They wanted to see prosperity. They wanted to see racial harmony. They wanted to see all these sorts of things. They wanted to see peace. And we thought, well, they're all saying similar things, but radically different policies to us, but not to each other. So we decided to embark on a, on a, a, a venture uh, of dialogue weekends. I'm a tremendous believer in dialogue in dialogue, in having people get to understand each other and demythologize each other. And so how we did it uh, isn't time to narrate, but we, we ha harried and we chased every one of these top leaders in political parties from the Central Committee of the Communist Party to the one settler, one bullet, to the give us a million guns people. And we put together a series of six dialogical weekends with about 15 to 20 senior politicians right across the spectrum. A few of them were Christians, others were communists, others were atheists, others were secularists, uh, uh, you're Muslim, whatever, you know. And we came together. Uh, how we got them was, I think the Lord was in it. And we had a lot of people praying backstage for this. I believe so much can be done when there's prayer backing something up. And we, we, we came together and they said, well, now, 
you know, what are you asking us to do? We said, very simple. What we want you to do is to tell your story. Give us your autobiography. And, and then tell us what is your vision for New South Africa and how you think we can get there. Well, I tell you, once we launched these people on autobiographies, they were meant to take half an hour or 40 minutes. Some of them went to, uh, they were so caught up in telling their story. <coughs> Some of these stories were absolutely staggering. And so, you know, blacks were hearing about Afrikaners who wanted a separate state and were scared of blacks because of what the British had done to them in the Boer War. And one said, I, I, my grandfather was made to walk around Pretoria by a British soldier with a sign around his neck saying, I am a donkey, I cannot speak English. So he said, we don't want domination from the Brit British and we certainly don't want it from the black. That's why we want separation. Some of the blacks said, oh wow, we didn't know much about what, how they felt after the Boer War. But then there were some of the blacks who shared out of their stories. And I can tell you a whole bunch. But there was one fellow who was there and he said, I was 20 years on Robin Island with Nelson Mandela. And he said, one day the guards took me out and they made me dig a hole about five or nearly six feet deep. And I spent the whole morning digging with these four or five guards around me. Finally, when I had dug the hole, they forced me to get into the hole. And then he said, they filled it up with sand and soil again till just my head was sticking out from the sand. And then he said, they all urinated on me. Well, there was a big silence. And every one of us whites, and certainly the Africana people, we had government, we had cabinet ministers listening to this. We said, you know what? If someone had done that to us, do you know what we would say? One settler, one bullet. And suddenly there were Afrikaner government ministers, even, even a couple of cabinet ministers, saying, we apologize, we're so sorry. Did we really do that to you? And dear ones, I mean, I've, I've written a book on this story called, called Witness Forever. Uh, if anyone was interested, I could perhaps try and, and, and get you a copy. But what happened was that 90 enemies, and as I say, these weren't all Christians, these were humans. 90 enemies became friends. One of the things we did to help them find each other in common humanity was take them on game drives. And so without sitting around telling stories, we'd go out on a Land Rover, several Land Rovers, and we'd take the binoculars and look at the rhino and look at the elephant and get out and find a little place to get out and have a drink and a picnic. And you saw these sworn enemies, some of whom came with AK-47s, some came with revolvers, some came with bodyguards, sworn enemies sitting down over a, over a cool drink and a, and a picnic and suddenly saying, hey, you know what? You're a human being. Or you see a radical right wing on the Africana and, and the Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, African, having a swim together in the swimming pool. And I, I, I saw this power of common humanity at work. So it was, it was actually, you know, an incredible thing. This, all of this led on uh, to our feeling that there was hope for South Africa, but we needed further facilitation for people to find each other. And this led us to the bringing into South Africa of a, a Kenyan diplomat and econo economist who'd been trained by Henry Kissinger to come in and begin to move around amongst the parties. And it was at the same time that Mandela and Boutelezi and de Klerk were calling for international mediation. And they called in Henry Kissinger to lead it with Lord Carrington, the British former British Foreign Secretary co-leading with Kissinger. And they got the, the top South African players together. This is 11 uh, or 12 days before the election because South Africa was burning. We were moving towards April 20, 27th and an election and it didn't look like you could have elections. In our area, 20 people a day were dying, 70 every weekend. And, and this was a convulsion we were in. And uh, anyway, Kissinger and Carrington came in. Our friend Washington, in the meantime, been moving around. And, and then we, we got him to be advisor to the international mediators. And uh, we met Mr. Kissinger, and I said to him, sir, we're praying for you. And he looked a little startled. 
wondering if that would help. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, then they went off to meet. And 24 hours later, Washington phoned me. He said, the whole thing's broken down. Kissinger's going home. He says, there'll be Armageddon here within two weeks. The US State Department got a message to us saying, in your area of Natal, we predict a million people are going to die in the next couple of weeks. And Washington said, everyone's going home, including me. I said, no, brother, you're not. You know, you know more about it than, than everybody else together. I said, you need to continue the next few days. Uh, forget about the others. To, to try to pull together a basis for the two different sides, especially the Zulus under Prince Mangasudu Bukulezi and the other Zulus which were, were, who supported Mandela. Uh, and, you know, you can move amongst these people now. And the linkages we'd made in the Kolobi Lodge weekend, dialogue weekends, a group of friends, we gave to him, to Akumu. Here, you go and, you go and move amongst these people and these players which he did. The, 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 the formal international mediation broke down. And let me just say, I'm not against international mediation. In our bringing in Washington and Kuma, we were doing that. Some places you need a third party who can come in and objectively help people you know, to, find, to find each other. And uh, anyway, we, we had agreed that we would all meet at a rugby stadium on the 17th of April, 10 days before the election, for a prayer meeting we'd called. It was a war situation, very dangerous. We didn't know whether three people would come or 300 would come or 3,000 would come. But in the end, 25,000 came. And while the prayer, the prayer was going on in the stadium and in the prayer rally, in the VIP lounge upstairs, these top players were there. President, Azuma was there representing now our president, Mandela. Butlesi was there himself. Mr. Scutter was there, the government cabinet minister handling the election. Uh, and uh, the, the representatives of the three major players were there. And in the VIP lounge, while prayer was going on, an agreement was reached that could bring South Africa through to peaceful elections. And in the next couple of days, uh, I's were dotted, T's were crossed, and that was April 17th, 18th, the I's and T's were, were dealt with. And on the, on, on the 18th, Mandela, Butelezi, and Leclerc came on and said, we can go forward with the election. We've got just over a week to go. We'll adjust 84 million ballot papers. Uh, Parliament would meet in special session. And we came, th we came through then uh, t to to a, a realization that peace had come to South Africa. The secular journalists had no other words or language for it other than miracle. And it was, a, it was a miracle thing. One big paper had a huge headline saying the day God stepped in to save South Africa. Wall Street Journal had a full page on God and politics. Time magazine said history has thrown up an authentic miracle. Uh, the, uh, the BBC said the Jesus Peace Rally, that's what we call it, the prayer meeting, tipped the scales. So what, what I really want to say is that when you have massive uh, alienations, the real key thing is getting the prayer going. This is what I said to the Northern and Southern Irish. I said, if you win the battle on the ground, I mean, if you win the battle in the heavenlies, you'll win it on the ground because I don't have time to tell you now about you know, being invited to share this in Northern Ireland because uh, I'm a bit nervous that Charlie's going to open a trap door here and I'll fall through 300 feet into boiling oil if I go too much longer. Can I take five minutes? Okay. <laughs> um, but the, 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 it, it was an amazing thing which happened. But the prayer thing is critical. Um, and it was interesting that two years later, you know, things don't change immediately. Um, lots of stuff began to happen again. And in 1996, our province was coming up to provincial elections. And all this old struggle between African National Congress with Mandela and Butelezis and Carter Freedom Party uh, burst out again. And Mandela called uh, uh, three of us and he said, we're meant to have our first provincial elections but we can't have them because the place is burning. 
And I sat over a table from Mandela and two African bishops and myself, and he said, we politicians can't fix this. And beloved, one thing I want to try and get in your head is from 2 Corinthians 5, God said, the, the word says, God has given to who? Us, the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't give it to government, army, military, academia, business community, to us. So when we move out to activate that ministry, a special divine power comes in behind us. Mandela said, we can't fix it. And cutting a very long and rather dramatic story short, there were six weeks till those elections, and we decided to activate the whole church to take on the Ministry of Reconciliation wherever they were. We spoke to business people, we spoke to the media, change your rhetoric, we spoke to the army, we spoke to the police, uh, we spoke to the business community, uh, we spoke to school heads, we sent out 5,000 letters to 5,000, uh, I mean, many thousands of letters to 5,000 schools and a, a letter about reconciliation to each school child to give their parents. And the exciting thing was all the Christians of Natal swung in to take on this burden of the Ministry of Reconciliation. Every little old lady, every granny, every worker, every, you know, well, everybody got into it. And the death rate in our area came down from 20 a day in six weeks, 70, 80 at the weekend, to zero. And we had elections in peace. Time magazine again commented on it. But what I saw there was the importance of the church when it gets into the act. When Jimmy Carter was going into Burundi on an, a peace initiative with some other African, uh, some African leaders, you know, we said to Mr. Carter, don't ignore the church. And he, he went in, our brother Manuel may, 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 may vouch for this, and they had an initiative, but they left the church out. And I'm a great, great believer that this is the church's role. When we take it on, God blesses it in very, very powerful ways. I think time is pretty well gone for me to tell you about our efforts in Israel in the, and in the Middle East and uh, Christian Leadership Assembly with 11 Arab Asian nations and, and Jewish Israeli people. But maybe one thing I will just mention comes out of Northern Ireland. Out of Ireland. I love the Irish. Uh, my ancestry goes back a thousand years. We've got a family tree going back a thousand years in Ireland. And uh, I love the Irish. Well, the Irish love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Norman, I love you too. Oh. I love the Irish, absolutely love it. And two things when we went to Ireland, and I close with this. The first was to give people a sense of hope. If, if people are alienated, like in a marriage, the couple must have a hope that they can get it right. If they stay in despair, it's going to be very, very difficult. I had the privilege of sharing a platform with President Mary Robinson at Dublin Castle, and... Uh, not long after that, a combined Ireland, North Ireland, North South Ireland prayer breakfast with Catholic leaders, the Catholic Cardinal, the leaders, Martin Smith of the Orange Order, and all of this mix of politicians. They wanted to know about South Africa. I spoke to them from Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. This is the darkest moment in the history of Judah. I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Uh, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I said, you know, I said, you may see yourself here in Ireland as a polecat people, but we were far more a polecat nation than you ever were. But this is what God did for us in answer to prayer and in determination. And I spoke on, on their having a future and a hope. And I never, I've done many meetings with politicians, I never saw so many crying. One lady said to Carol, I've cried through all my handkerchiefs and I've used all the serviettes. Can you pass me some here? <laughs> because suddenly they got hope. And when people are alienated in the church or in the marketplace, they need hope that it can come right. The last thing I want to say, uh, and this is uh, something where I rebuke the Irish, their Irish memories are too long. <laughs> you know, in life, you, 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 we, we all tell we've got to have good memories. 
I'm doing my memoirs now, and Carol says, do them while you've still got a memoir, because uh, the, 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 the fact is that, 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 that we tend to forget. But the Irish tend to remember. And they remember back to and celebrate each year the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, when the Protestant William of Orange defeated the Catholic King James of England. They have an annual celebration by the Irish Protestants, and it often only produces more resentment and alienation in, in Catholics. And I was always saying to the Irish, develop a good forgettery. You need somehow to be able to leave past behind and move on to, the new, to a new future. I was speaking at a family conference in Ireland, and, and uh, I taught them a little mantra that we use in Africa, which says, God is greater, and then some, the speaker says, God is greater, they say all the time. The speaker says, all the time, they say, God is greater. So God is greater all the time. All the time, God is greater. Oh, they enjoyed that. Then I said to them, I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to say, God is greater than, God is greater than the crazy Irish. Then they have to say, all the time. <laughs> and then they say, God is greater than the crazy Irish. I say, all the time. So I said to them, you said it. And I said, well, with Mandela, when we had the, 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 the Battle of Blood River, December 16th, when the Afrikaners slaughtered a whole army of Zulus, and it was a huge point of resentment amongst blacks. And Mandela changed its name to a day of reconciliation. She said, I, we don't want to remember Blood River Battle. We want to remember that we've come to reconciliation. And then there was another day, June 1976, the 10th, when South African troops opened fire on teenagers in Soweto, called Youth Day. Every day, every year it was remembered. This is when a whole mass of our young people were killed by Afrikaner police. Mandela said, forget about it. It's going to be called Youth Day. The potential for good that can come out from the youth. So beloved, when we're trying to get reconciliation, sometimes we have to get to the hurts, have them identified, have them shared, have them confessed, have them forgiven, and then have people move on in hope for something brand new that can come. Well, that's a little bit higgledy-piggledy, all of this, and a bit of a gallop, but I hope I've given you the sort of broad contours of things that can be done, because South Africa did come to reconciliation in 1994. We, I think our latest president has, after Mandela, de-racialized us. I think Zuma is re-racializing us. And that's a challenge. So I keep saying to people in South Africa, don't throw away the miracle. So there we are. Um, have an eye for miracles. They can happen.